I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over to Chronix with Boken Octum, who's going to talk today about design for test with embedded FPGAs. So Vulcan, why do we even have to think about design for test when it comes to embedded FPGAs? So let's uh, take a step back and talk about DFT. What is DFT? And what it is, is essentially circuitry that's put in place to ensure that we can meet the test cost and coverage goals when doing defect testing for an embedded FPGA. Okay, why don't you draw this out for us? So what are we looking at here? Okay, so we've talked a little about DFT, right? Um, and what's important is being able to get to the coverage targets and doing it with uh, an acceptable amount of cost. So for coverage, we're looking at being able to hit 99% stuck at fault coverage and 85% transition delay fault coverage. And those are industry standard coverage levels, right? Yes, these are generally accepted as being industry standard. Okay. And on the cost front, generally what we're looking at is depending on the um, tester equipment and, and the flow, uh, every second of test time is between two cents to five cents. How does that change for an EFPGA versus a, a discrete chip? Is it comparable? The test costs are also very comparable, but the important thing to keep in mind is you have a lot more flexibility when doing discrete FPGAs because the test equipment and the FPGA are generally all owned by you. So in other words, you better get it right the first time here. Yes, and that's what we try to guide our customers. So when you're looking at an, at an embedded FPGA, what does the ATE test flow actually look like? The ATE test flow for an embedded FPGA is very similar to that of a discrete FPGA. What we're looking at is a large number of uh, configurations, bitstream programs, and followed by test vectors to be able to actually test the circuitry under test. So the reason why testing of programmable logic is always so challenging, especially when trying to meet cost targets, is because you have a very large number of configurations. We're talking in the order of a couple of thousand at least. So if each configuration takes even in the order of milliseconds, you are looking at a test flow that's in the order of multiple seconds for even a single iteration. Does the test time vary depending upon the size of an, the FPGA? Because an embedded FPGA can be sized according to whatever you need, right? Correct. The embedded FPGA can be sized based on your needs. And the test time is highly dependent on the actual size of the embedded FPGA. The reason for that is because a very large percentage of the test time is actually spent programming the embedded FPGA core. So the larger the core, the more time, the more memory you're going to be needing to actually program the core itself. Is one implementation of an embedded FPGA the same as another, regardless of the size? Is it always the same or is each one unique and therefore requires a different test program? Each core can be built based on the customer's requirements. So the number of lookup tables, the number of memories, the number of DSP elements can all be tailored to what the customer's needs are. And so even if the diary is the same, the fact that the resource mix may be different will require a different test program. So typically with an embedded FPGA, there's a fairly large number of bitstream configurations followed right. by test vectors, right? Yes. What does that do to the testing? Well, like we said earlier, the test time is very high because of that. And the, the reason why you need such a large number of configurations is because every mode of every tile in the fabric, every setting of a routing mux needs to be tested. And when you serially go through each of those settings, you end up with a very large number of configurations in the fabric. So that's one portion of the AT test program flow. The other portion is where we have a boundary interface that um, requires standard ASIC scan-like testing. And because that is also done serially with the testing of the fabric, that also adds to the test time. With an embedded FPGA, you've also got things like uh, insertion and iteration count, right? Which are a little bit different than what people would normally be doing with an ASIC. Uh, to be honest, they are fairly standard methodologies that are used for ASICs as well as discrete FPGAs. What we're talking about there is a, an iteration is where you go through a test flow for either a particular test condition, like max voltage testing, um, or where you go through either sort or packaged part testing. So the fact that you have to do each one of those independently means that the test time needs to be multiplied by a certain number. 
So generally with both ASICs and discrete FPGAs, what you're looking at is either four or six iterations. And the reason for that is because you have to do cold temperature testing, hot temperature testing, in some cases room temperature testing, both at max voltage and min voltage. How does this work out in terms of cost and time? What's the, what's the relationship here? So we talked a little about what the test cost is per second. Now let's take a look at an example and use some metrics to determine what actually the total cost is when doing pro uh, programmable logic testing of an embedded FPGA. In general, the metric that we have for cur current generation products is a, a 10K LUT configuration takes about one second of testing per iteration. If we use that metric to determine an example 100K lookup table core with a six iteration flow, in an ASIC that has a volume of 5 million parts, what we end up with is one second times the 100K over 10K for the ratio times the number of iterations. And conservatively, we're estimating two seconds, two cents per second of, of uh, test cost times the 5 million of volume. We're looking at $6 million of cost for just testing this programmable logic inside the ASIC. And this is a cost that you have to weigh in as you're starting to build these things, thinking, what is this chip going to actually run me as I'm, I'm developing this, right? Exactly. And it's important to keep this cost in mind because a lot of the decisions that are made as far as programming modes, as far as programming frequencies, need to take these numbers into consideration. That's a fairly large number. Can it be improved? Yes, it is a very large number, and we've already started putting in place a number of architectural optimizations to help bring that number down significantly. I'd like to talk about a few of them, actually. So one of the assumptions that we're making earlier is that the configuration is being done with the widest configuration mode available, and that it's being done at 100 megahertz. We are already implementing a scheme that will allow us to run at a higher speed, at double the speed, at 200 megahertz. So that will have a direct impact on both the programming time as well as the time it takes to run the test vectors. The second idea that we have is we talked about serially testing the fabric and then the boundary. We're looking at ways of being able to do that in parallel so that the time taken for the boundary can be essentially integrated into the time taken to test the fabric. And the third idea that we have is leveraging the regularity that we have in the programmable logic fabric. Embedded FPGAs traditionally have very regular structures. And in this case, we've shown clusters of programmable logic that have the same resource mix, the same routing, and the same tiles. So the idea behind this is we leverage the regularity here to be able to test these clusters in parallel. And so the coverage doesn't really change, right? Because these are very regular structures. It's basically that you're doing more things at once. Exactly. The coverage will be what we've targeted here earlier, but as far as test time goes, we'd be looking at at least an order of magnitude improvement. And what that will translate into is a order of magnitude reduction in the test cost. Is there any different skill set that's required for when you're thinking about an embedded FPGA versus a standard ASIC on testing? The methodologies are fairly similar. The one notable difference is that as an embedded FPGA, we have to be very clear about what requirements we have to impose on the ASIC integrator so that we can actually do the testing and get the coverage and the cost that we need. Because when these are discrete FPGAs, it's a whole different beast and you're used to working with an FPGA, but now you're basically putting the two of these together, right? Exactly. We have a lot of guidelines to help ASIC integrators be able to successfully integrate the embedded FPGA into their ASIC. Obviously, the user mode functionality is imperative, but in talking about DFT and tests, we do have a set of guidelines for them to follow so that we can actually get the coverage that we need in a reasonable amount of cost. Vulcan Octum, thank you very much for a great explanation. It was my pleasure. Thank you.